Why is this game not so hard? Oh, hey. Um, I went back to check up on Celeste and I found something funny looking. This is not how I remembered it. I never thought I'd see you again. We all know Celeste, a 2D platformer that's well known for its innovative gameplay, level design, and unique story. It's one of the most popular indie titles of all time, and it brought together many people around the world. It's a game focused on depression and finding self-worth, in which we have to overcome our passive limitations and climb to achieve peace. Literally. I had a lot of fun playing the game and it's definitely one of my favorite games of all time, which I never really expected. I never expected an indie game that I'd never heard of before to become one of my all-time favorites. It's astonishing. I like everything that there is about Celeste, except of course, the B-side levels. That one level still gives me nightmares to this day. But by the time I talked about Celeste, it was already around 5 years old. It's weird because obviously I've never heard of this game before, but the game felt like it came around during the pandemic. And it is something that felt like it could have been released in that timeline. But again, it's still amazing that there are still people around the world playing this game and making videos about it, which shows how Celeste still has an active player base. So to commemorate the game's 6th anniversary, the indie studio Maddie Makes Games developed a free bite-sized game titled Celeste 64 Fragments of the Mountain. As the title suggests, this is a take on Super Mario 64, turning Celeste, a 2D platformer, into 3D, while also keeping the textures a bit low rest to make it feel like we're playing an actual N64 game. You can easily download this game on your PC, just go to the official website and click download. Once you downloaded the game, you should get it running. However, upon running the game for the first time, I got a security notice. I don't know if it's just me, but... If it isn't, then this should be fixed, though it's a very minor complaint. So far, I didn't get any viruses on my laptop. Thank you, Maddie. So this is Celeste 64. Like I said earlier, it's a small game, so it explains why this game only has one giant area. Another thing to say for the developers of the game, when I played the game for the first time, I used the keyboard, and for some reason, the spacebar won't register the jump. Every other keybind works except for this one button. I get it that a controller is recommended for this since it's 3D and designed to play like Mario 64, but it really would have been nice if you could play on a keyboard with ease. I finished Celeste with a keyboard, so why is it so janky here? I get it, programming is hard and kudos to the developers for delivering yet another edition for Celeste, but the keyboard controls are one thing I have to point out. The fact that you can't even change the controls is also a problem too, which wouldn't be a problem for people who played Celeste before in using the default controls, but it's been a long time since I played it and clearly I forgot what the controls were. So after a short back to basics tutorial, we finally meet Granny once again. So correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't Granny dead in the last game? Like in chapter 9, wasn't it confirmed that she died? I don't know, but it's nice to see her back for its anniversary. So this is basically the entire game. It's just one giant area with a bunch of strawberries to collect. It's similar to Super Mario 64, one level is essentially one area with a bunch of stars to collect. It doesn't matter in what order you collect the strawberries, you just collect them. At the same time, there are also B-side tracks that you can find around the area. We'll get there eventually, but let's take a look at what we have here for now. Most of the core gameplay mechanics from Celeste are brought back here. The feather, which makes you fly for a few moments, the shards that grant you a charge of dash. Speaking of, remember in Celeste where at the last three levels, you can double dash due to story reasons. Well, upon the starting that game, we don't have that, and it'll make sense in a few moments. The entire area is littered with obstacle courses. With how open this place is, there are a lot of ways you can collect strawberries. One thing you notice that whenever you climb a wall, you don't get tired unlike in the base game, which is an odd thing to change from the game, but it makes sense since this time it's in 3D and some things have to be altered for it to work here. There are also a bunch of secret areas that you can unlock, but I won't spoil it for you because I'm a good guy. But I will say there are signs that you can find which can help you find them. 
Going back to the gameplay, there's also one more thing I have to add. So whenever you're like in mid-air or something, there's this line that appears Madeline that helps you track where she's going to land. It's a fine addition here since it's 3D, but the landing feels off. If, even if I move the thumbstick a centimeter away, it somehow registers me falling to my death. The controls here sometimes have perfect input, but most of the time it's a tad bit too sensitive. Also, you can face the camera straight down to where you are. It's always at an angle which makes landing a bit harder. Moving back to the story, at the top of this building we meet Theo. Just like before, he's still chill as ever. And I'm sorry but this has gotta be his best line yet. Well, there's not much to talk about here anymore, it's just collecting strawberries and finishing each obstacle. There's this one sign that I stumbled upon and it's something that I have to point out. This sign tells you how to skid jump, which is going to be insanely useful in one of the B-side tracks. Essentially what it does is you run at full speed, then you turn around quickly and jump as fast as you can. The timing here is key and it's something to try to get used to. It's a pain in the ass to learn, but it's pretty much required for one of the B-side tracks, so believe me here. Speaking of, let's go ahead to the B-side tracks. Just like the last game, the B-side tracks are a harder and more challenging version of each specific level. Since it's one giant area and the B-side tracks are scattered everywhere like strawberries, each B-side track contains its own specific challenge. So this first one I attempted gave me Vietnam flashbacks. The platforms appear according to the beat of the song in the background, which you don't really need to listen to carefully, but it's a nice starting point to figure out the timing. Luckily, this one ain't as bad compared to that nightmare. It's much shorter and less challenging, but still difficult nonetheless. So what I did here is I tried to climb onto the walls and jump to the other side and climb onto it the moment I touch it. I don't know if there's a better strategy for this, but this is the one that I used. Overall, not the hardest one, but an easiest one. For this next one, since you can climb without getting tired, this is pretty easy. You just gotta make sure that your jumps are angled properly. I got a bit greedy there. For this one, you gotta be quick on your feet. You also gotta make sure to angle the camera properly since that's going to be a major benefit for you. This one took a while as well, but it was a really fun one. Now this is the one I was talking about. This is where the skid jump is going to come in handy. A regular jump won't reach that shard, so if you skid jump correctly, you should get to the other platform and onwards. The problem here is the skid jump itself. The controls are a bit whack here and it's hard to get the skid jump to work. Even if you did a successful skid jump, most of the time you're going to be facing in the other direction instead of going straight. And you have to do this twice. For the second part, you have to angle yourself properly to try to activate all those spears and not touch the spikes. And like any other obstacle in the game, you have to restart from the beginning if you fail. I don't like this one. So let's move on to another area. If you climb to the top of this tower, the one with a ton of spikes, there's this feather here that can get you to that island. If you go there, you meet Badalyn, our antagonistic counterpart. I don't know if this island is another Super Mario 64 reference, but who knows. This is where you can end the game and see the amount of time you took to get here and how many strawberries you collected. Upon reading the sign, we finally get these voiceover credits. And that's pretty much the entire game. It's a well-rounded addition to Celeste, but it does have its problems. The controls, the platforming, the game itself is a bit too short for my liking. It's nice that it's free, but I wish we had more stuff here than what we actually got. It's a nice take on turning Celeste into 3D, and I like how even the characters notice that change. It's really cool. There isn't much story here, even if you talk to every character here, you guys just chat about what happened, and it's nice, it's normal, but what about stuff that's happened, or that's about to happen? None of them hinted at the possibility of there being a sequel, other than this dialogue between Badalyn, but even then, it could have been an entirely different thing. And not every character is here. I mean, what about that hotel guy? I know he's dead, but he was a character in the last game. And there's only one area here, so that doesn't make the game as replayable as Celeste. If only this game had more, it would have been a lot better, but given with what we have now, I think it's enough. All in all, it's a nice addition to Celeste and a love letter to the fanbase. Wow. Wait. That's actually a real thing? 
I thought this was some sort of shit post. So if this is real and official, can this be also real and official? Yeah, I don't know.